Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this event on challenging Canada's $19 billion planned warplane purchase. My name is Rachel Small. I'm the Canada organizer with World Beyond War. Uh, World Beyond War is a global grassroots network of volunteers, activists, and allied organizations all advocating for the abolition of war and the institution of war and its replacement with a just and sustainable peace. We have members in 175 countries worldwide who are working to debunk the myths of war and advocating for and taking concrete steps to, to build an alternative global security system that's based on demilitarizing security, managing conflict nonviolently, and, and creating a culture of peace. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight for this discussion. I'm thrilled to be in the company of uh, audience members and speakers from across the country. We gather today truly from coast to coast to coast. And given the theme of tonight's event, I would be remiss to not start off by highlighting that uh, something of relevance to all of us from all coasts and, and in between that the foundational war of this country is of course one of colonization that this violence continues to this day and is deeply relevant to our topic tonight. Um, I mean, one need only look at this week's headlines alone to witness the ongoing colonial violence against indigenous peoples from Tsotsowitan land in the far west to Mi'kma'ki in the east. I'm speaking with you all now from Toronto on Dish with One Spoon and Treaty 13 indigenous territory and less than 100 kilometers away from 1492 Land Back Lane, where Haudenosaunee land defenders and their allies have been arrested by the dozens while peacefully reclaiming Six Nations land along the Haldeman Tract. So I, I wanted to name and acknowledge that, that broader context as we begin this event um, that of course is centered on the Canadian government's planned purchase of 88 warplanes. Um, considering the importance and the impact of this decision, uh, not to mention the sheer cost, this purchase is set to be the second most expensive procurement in Canadian history. Um, there's been remarkably little public and governmental discussion of that, and uh, that's, that's part of what this event is intended to address. We have a number of speakers tonight. The basic format of this event uh, will that each speaker will be given the floor for 10 minutes after which we will open the floor to questions from the audience. Um, but without further delay, I'm now going to pass the mic to my co-host, Bianca Mujeni, Director of the Canadian Foreign Policy, Policy Institute. Hi, Bianca. Hi, thank you, Rachel. Um, so a big welcome to all of you, um, to all of our panelists for being here to help us challenge the Liberals' planned $19 billion fighter jet purchase. Uh, I want to thank our co-host, World Beyond War, who put so much work into this event, as well as our media sponsor, Canadian Dimension, um, who made our lovely graphics and are helping us with the live streaming. I also want to thank our co-sponsor, Peace Quest, um, who will be live tweeting from the Peace Quest uh, Leadership and Education Initiative account, so you can check that out. Um, also, Really big thanks and appreciation to our supporting organizations who have endorsed this event, Science for Peace, the Regina Peace Council, uh, the Victoria Peace Coalition, the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War, and People for Peace London. It's, um, it's really wonderful to see so many of you um, turning up for this event. Um, thank you for tuning in. Um, uh, as uh, you might have noted from the, the chat, we're also live streaming to Facebook as well. So just check there for the actual uh, chat link. And if you have any friends who um, still want to join and haven't registered, no worries. Um, the link should be in the chat for, for, for folks to, to, to join in. So please share that. We'd also really love for this event to be interactive, uh, impactful, and to reach a wider audience. So. Um, you know, it's harder for us to rally um, in these times. So for those of us who are on social media, um, please help us to get the word out about our opposition to this fighter jet purchase by posting in tandem if you can. Um, sample tweets can be found in the Google Doc that uh, Greta is going to be posting in the chat as well. So check that out. 
Um, you can also retweet from World Beyond War, Foreign Policy, um, Canadian Dimension, Peace Quest accounts. So um, in a bit of housekeeping, the, um, the chat is now open and um, we're really looking forward to hearing from you um, at home and excited about the exchange of ideas. Um, we just have the very basic uh, request that you keep your comments civil, um, racism, sexism, or otherwise hateful um, or harmful commentary is not welcome and anyone posting comments of that nature will be removed from the chat. So as Rachel mentioned, my name is Bianca Majeni. I'm here representing the newly formed Canadian Foreign Policy Institute and um, we're hosting this event alongside uh, World Beyond War, um, co-hosting with Rachel. The Canadian Foreign Policy Institute uh, challenges unjust foreign policy measures and aims to bridge the gap between the perception and reality uh, of Canada's role in the world. Um, and we, uh, we, we, we sort of formed um, in, in the aftermath of Canada's second consecutive defeat for a seat on the United Nations Security Council in June, um, when we launched a call for a fundamental reassessment of Canadian foreign policy. And um, this open letter to Trudeau includes a critique of Canadian militarism. Um, and one of the 10 questions that we ask is, should Canada continue to be a part of NATO or uh, instead pursue non-military paths to peace in the world? And it's been signed by more than 50 organizations from Greenpeace Canada to 350 um, uh, Canada to I Don't Know More and um, the Vancouver District Labor Council, as well as four sitting MPs and um, people like David Suzuki and Naomi Klein and many others. So you can find out more about this uh, campaign for a reset of Canadian foreign policy at foreignpolicy.ca. Now, this event is taking place with um, within the context of the Liberal government Trudeau planning uh, to purchase 88 new cutting edge fighter jets for a starting price of $19 billion. And at the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, we believe these expensive carbon intensive fighter jets uh, should not be purchased and would be of, of little use um, in providing international humanitarian relief in dealing with an attack like 9-11 in overcoming a global pandemic or the climate crisis um, that we find ourselves in. Spending $19 billion on um, cutting edge fighter jets only makes sense within a vision of fighting in future US and NATO wars, uh, which Canada has done far too much of in recent years. So we've added our name to the growing call to stop the purchase of uh, these fighter jets. And we hold the position that Canada should not be aiming to be a more capable partner um, of the US military or NATO, and we support a reduction in military spending and redistribution of these resources to uh, a just transition away from, fo from fossil fuels. So following um, the two recent National Days of Action um, at two dozen MPs offices against the warplane purchase, um, we feel it's critical to hear uh, voices in Parliament and beyond who are also keen to engage um, with this growing resistance to the planned fighter jet purchase. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Um, Tamara Lawrence is a PhD candidate at the Balsillie School for International Affairs. She's a member of the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, the Canadian Pugwash Group, the No to NATO Network. Tamara is also on the International Advisory Council of World Beyond War um, and the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. Welcome, Tamara. Thank you, Rachel and Bianca. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to begin with a little bit of background information. So as Bianca said, last year, the federal government launched a $19 billion competition for 88 new fighter jets. At the end of July of this year, the weapons manufacturers submitted their bids. And in the running are three combat aircraft, Boeing Super Hornet, Saab's Gripen, and Lockheed Martin's F-35 stealth fighter. The Trudeau government has said that it will pick one of 
picked the winning bid by early 2022, and they expect that the first combat aircraft to be delivered by 2025. This procurement is the second most expensive federal procurement in Canadian history. But the government has not yet signed a contract, and we want to stop it. We want to permanently cancel or indefinitely delay the buying of these new fighter jets, and we think this is possible. Uh, let me give you a little bit of history. For the past 15 years, the federal government has been wanting to buy new fighter jets to replace the Canadian Air Force's aging CF-18s. In 2008, uh, Prime Minister Stephen Harper and his Conservative government announced a defence policy called the Canada First Defence Strategy, and in it, they stated that they wanted to buy next generation fighter jets. The Harper government then initiated a sole source contract to buy 65 Lockheed Martin F-35s for $9 billion. They even had a fancy photo op with Lockheed Martin officials and announced that they were going to buy the stealth aircraft. But peace groups and concerned citizens mobilized and we raised concerns about the cost of the F-35 and the many ongoing technical problems with the aircraft to the point that the government couldn't go through with the contract. Then in 2015, Stephen Harper and the Conservative governments lost the federal election. Trudeau and the Liberals ran on an election platform that they wouldn't buy the F-35s, but promised to have an open competition for new fighter jets. In 2017, the Liberal government announced its first defense uh, policy called Strong, Secure and Engaged. It stated that they would buy 88 new fighter jets, even more than what Harper wanted, to meet our NATO and NORAD commitments. The government also said in the policy that it wanted to spend $553 billion on the military over the next 20 years to maintain high-end war fighting. Many defense analysts think that the Liberal government will choose the F-35s, and that's because over the past two decades, since 1997, Canada has already spent 540 million US dollars to be part of the F-35 development consortium. Canada's closest allies, the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia, have already purchased the stealth fighter. However, Former Deputy Minister of National Defense, Charles Nixon, has argued that Canada doesn't need any fighter jets. He said that Canada doesn't face any credible threat that requires fighter jets and that they are not necessary to protect our country or sovereignty. Earlier this year, I also was contacted by a retired fighter jet pilot in British Columbia who also said that Canada doesn't need new fighter jets. The pressure to buy new fighter jets is coming from the United States and from NATO. And we know from WikiLeaks embassy cables that the United States put intense pressure on Norway to buy new F-35s. Now let's consider how Canada has used our fighter jets since the end of the Cold War over the past two decades. In 1999, the Canadian fighter jets with NATO illegally bombed Serbia. We killed civilians and destroyed civilian infrastructure. In 2011, Canadian fighter jets led the NATO bombing of Libya, leading to a massive humanitarian and refugee crisis across North Africa. Libya is still in chaos. From 2014 to 2016, Canadian fighter jets uh, with the United States bombed Syria and Iraq. Tens of thousands of bombs were dropped on those two countries, killing civilians, destroying infrastructure, and leading to mass migration. Right now, Canadian fighter jets are involved in a dangerous NATO operation in Romania, provoking Russia. Our fighter jets shouldn't be flying anywhere near Russia's borders. Fighter jets fuel violent conflict. They don't bring peace. Fighter jets are also fueling the climate crisis. The military is by far the largest source of carbon emissions in the federal government. Worse still, in Canada, military emissions are exempt from the National Greenhouse Gas Reduction Target, and there are no plans to offset these military emissions. Last year, the Cost of War Project at Brown University released a study on military fuel use and climate change. Among all branches of the military, it's the Air Force that uses the most fuel. Fighter jets use an exorbitant exorbitant amount of specialized toxic fuel called JP-8, which allows them to fly faster um, and at higher altitudes than commercial aircraft. A fighter jet carries and consumes about 15,000 pounds of fuel or seven tons. 
uh, to fly one long range flight. They are also extremely costly to operate. The average hourly cost is in the range of 15,000 to 50,000 per hour, depending on the aircraft. One or two hours of flying a fighter jet is equivalent to the yearly salary of an essential worker. The price uh, tag, $19 billion, doesn't include the life cycle costs. Eight years ago, the Federal Auditor General estimated that the life cycle cost for new fighter jets will be about $45 billion. And at that time, the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives estimated that it would be as high as $126 billion. Today, it will be even higher. If Canada buys these new fighter jets, it will mean that we will have to keep pumping oil from the ground. Think of the fighter jets as pipelines in the sky. They will cause carbon lock-in for the next four decades. They will prevent Canada from rapidly decarbonizing and meeting our Paris Agreement and from achieving net zero emissions by 2050. As you all know, the greatest threats that we are all facing is the global health crisis and catastrophic climate change. This summer, peace groups and concerned citizens across the country came together and we launched a campaign to stop the federal government from buying these new fighter jets. On July 24th, we. Uh, a week before the bids were due, we had our National Day of Action. We stood in front of our members of parliaments, offices with signs, new, no new fighter jets, and delivered letters to our MPs. On October 2nd, the International Day of Nonviolence, we had our second day of action. Um, we have heard from two Liberal MPs, uh, Catherine McKenna and Bardish Chagger, who replied to our letters, and they said that fighter jets will be good for jobs uh, for Canada. However, these fighter jets can't be built in, in this country. Defence economist Ergahan Burkok at the Royal Military College confirms this. Buying new fighter jets will primarily enrich American or Swedish weapons manufacturers. Moreover, Research in the United States at the University of Massachusetts and at Brown University shows that military spending is not good for job creation. One billion dollars spent on the military creates far fewer jobs than one billion dollars invested in healthcare, education, or the environment. Fighter jets are also bad for women and they don't allow, uh, align with Canada's feminist foreign policy. The aerospace and defense sector in this country is, is a male-dominated industry and the military is a male-dominated institution. What women and working mothers need in this country is affordable housing and a national early learning and childcare strategy, something that women have been demanding for 50 years but we still don't have. Fighter jets are for fighting. They are to give Canada a combat capability. This means bombing, destroying, and killing. They are for a death economy. The same logic um, that says we need a just transition to convert our oil and gas sector to renewables is the same logic that we need for a just transition and conversion of our aerospace and defense sector to peaceful civilian industries. Finally, I want to stress that if Canada goes ahead and buys these fighter jets, it will be a theft from our First Nations communities, a theft from the poor, and a theft from our youth. This spring, 34 Anishinaabe and Dakota communities wrote a letter to the federal government asking for Cuban doctors and nurses to come to Canada to help them with the pandemic because their communities have inadequate health care. Last year, the UN Special Rapporteur for Indigenous Peoples described the decrepit housing conditions of our First Nation, Nations communities in this country as abhorrent. Plus, there are 200,000 homeless Canadians. There are 1 million Canadians that use food banks. The cost of just one fighter jet is the budget of all 3,000 food banks across the country combined. This pandemic has made us all pause and reflect on what is important and what provides real security. The pandemic has also showed that change is possible and that peaceful collaboration with other countries is essential. Russia and China are not our enemies. We need to work cooperatively with them to deal with the pandemic and to deal with the climate emergency. We need to have the courage to challenge our membership in NATO and NORAD. We need to rethink our relationship with the United States, the most aggressive country on the planet that doesn't even provide health care to its own people. I would like to close with this comment by the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio uh, Guterres, who has repeatedly called for a global ceasefire. And he said, the fury of the virus illustrates the folly of 
war, silence the guns, stop the artillery, and end the airstrikes. Finally, I want to make a direct appeal to the NDP to please stop your support for the fighter jets and to the Green Party. Please make a public statement against these carbon, carbon intensive combat aircraft. And to the Senate, um, please demand a gender based analysis and a, an environmental assessment and make these public of these new fighter jets. And to everyone watching and listening, please join our campaign, No New Fighter Jets. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, Tamara, for your passionate and very clear appeal. I'm grateful uh, for the sheer amount of information and the different perspectives on your opposition that you offered in such a, a short period. Um, the next speaker this evening is Paul Manley. Paul Manley uh, serves as the Member of Parliament for Nanaimo Ladysmith, a member of the Green Party of Canada. He was elected to the House of Commons in 2019, making him the second elected Green Federal MP in Canadian history. He's also the party's foreign critic. Paul Manley is also a filmmaker and former director on the National Board of the Council of Canadians. Thank you for joining us, Paul. Well, thank you very much, Bianca, and uh, thank you, Tamara, for that excellent presentation. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, the traditional unceded territory of the Snoqualmie First Nation, uh, the Halkomenum Coast Salish people, and my riding Nanaimo Ladysmith is within the territory of Snoqualmie, Snoqualmie, Staminas, and Lyaxon. They're all Halkomenum speaking people. Um, the GPC, the Green Party, is on the record as being opposed to the purchase of fighter jets, and in particular, these F-35s. Uh, since 2010, Elizabeth May has been raising the alarm about the idea that Canada should purchase uh, F-35s. Her warnings from 10 years ago are even truer today as they were then. Elizabeth labeled the F-35 program as an abject lesson in what U.S. President Eisenhower warned about in his farewell address uh, to the nation. The president warned about the military industrial complex. And the F-35 is indeed a boondoggle for the history books of the military industrial complex. Uh, in terms of, of Green Party policy, there's been a lot of debate about whether we should, we should be in NATO. We, uh, we have policy on NATO and I think we're, we have a policy committee uh, a convention coming up and we'll have some discussion about uh, revamping our policy. But as it stands right now, uh, under defense policy, the most discussed issue of defense policy and procurement has been the, the proposed purchase of the F-35 fighter jets, the evidence that uh, the Harper cabinet deliberately misled the Canadian public about the price and benefits of the F-35s was cemented by the uh, 2013 report by the Auditor General, and the benefits were overhyped and the cost lowballed. Uh, the debate over the F-35s has distracted Canadians from a full and transparent discussion about what the appropriate role is for our military in the 21st century. We need to seriously question the need for a significant increase in military spending. Why would Canada need stealth fight, fighter jets, you know, for anything else than an attack with first strike capability? These are offensive weapons. Canada has responsibilities towards its allies. However, the Green Party does not believe that Canada should unequivocally support NATO missions. Our policy as it relates to NATO states that Canada needs to realign our defense spending to increase our capacity and speed in delivering uh, disaster assistance through DART, the Disaster Assistance Rapid Response Team, and our contribution to UN peacekeeping forces and missions and decrease our contributions to NATO war efforts. Uh, the policy goes on to state that we should review Canada's membership in military alliances, including NATO and NORAD, and ensure they are meeting Canada's priorities for diplomacy, development, and defense. And we should press NATO allies to get out of the nuclear weapons business. The Green Party opposes military inter interventions, and Elizabeth May was the only MP to vote against the bombing of Libya. We all know how that turned out, and we now have a failed state. The F-35 is an offensive weapon, and, and the whole thing has been a, a debacle. Canada should have nothing to do with it. It is also the most expensive plane Canada would ever buy and maintain if we were to do so. 
cost of an F-35 for Canada, including purchasing, training, maintenance over the life of the plane, coming at almost half a billion dollars per plane. $3.2 billion can fix the water situation in every First Nation reserve and community in Canada. And that would be the equivalent of six F-35s. In terms of the military industrial complex, US weapons procurement is famous for graft. The military industrial complex is based on rapacious weapons manufacturing of uh, corporate giants who spend lavishly on political contributions to both US part political parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, and spread weapons component manufacturing to every state in the US and to many counties, as, as many counties as possible in order to make it near impossible for senators and congresspeople to criticize weapons programs. There's also a revolving door between the Pentagon and weapons manufacturers. Uh, programs often end up spending 50% or more over budget and grossly underdevelop on promised results. In 2001, when Pentag the Pentagon declared Lockheed Martin the winner of the five-year competition against Boeing for the opportunity to build the F-35, the contract was esti estimated to be worth 200 billion over three decades. The latest numbers I have founder of the Pentagon is saying we'll spend 379 billion over four decades to develop and purchase more than uh, 2,400 planes. Training and maintenance for the planes over their lifetime is estimated at an additional 600 billion that brings it to around $1 trillion. Those kinds of sums buy a lot of political influence. Canada should never and in no way tie ourselves to the US military industrial complex with a $1.4 trillion on the line to skew the oversight of such a project. Political meddling in defense procurement in the US is so bad that even independent Senator Bernie Sanders, who I admire and who has disparaged the F-35 as an example of the Pentagon's long record of purchasing weapon systems from defense contractors with massive cost overruns that have wasted hundreds of billions of taxpayer dollars, Sanders has endorsed the idea of bringing 18 of the fighters to Burlington, uh, the international airport there in, in 2019 to replace a squadron of aging F-16s flown by the Vermont Air, Air National Ground in the face of local opposition to noise and other environmental objections. Sanders said at a town hall meeting in 2014, my view is that given the reality of the damn plane, I'd rather it come to Vermont than South Carolina. And that's what the Vermont National Guard wants. That means hundreds of jobs in my city, that's it. So, you know, even, even somebody who is vocally opposed to the military industrial complex is, you know, bought into this uh, because that's the way it works in the United States. There are technical issues with this plane. Uh, critics of the F-35 have called it a jack of all trade and master of none. This plane is supposed to be able to provide three different uh, versions to answer the different needs of the US Air Force, the Navy, and the Marines. And in nearly every single aspect, when compared to the, to the legacy plane it was supposed to replace in that field, a legacy plane can beat it. The F-16 is better in the air to air dogfight. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, better known as the Warthog, is better at providing support for ground troops. There are so many truly incredible technical problems with the plane that I could probably spend a few hours just reading a laundry list of them. Uh, but I'll highlight one at this stage. The, the F-35 sensor and visor display systems have so many problems that test pilots have stated that there is too much signal noise and have res resorted to turning off sensors that they fe felt were causing more risk to the plane's operation. Is this type of stealth technology even relevant anymore? Like we, we, we don't need it uh, as Canadians. Clearly, like this is an offensive weapon. We want, we're a, a nation that should be uh, involved in peacekeeping and diplomacy and defending ourselves in rational ways, not, not uh, buying um, uh, offensive weapons. Long range, Radar and passive detection systems have now both proved that they can detect and track stealth aircraft. Um, passive detection systems are very hard to detect and counter because it 
works on the principle of using at least three vast geographically spaced antennae to detect and triangulate radio frequencies and radio, radar signals from a plane that is invisible to radar. So even if a stealth plane flies under complete radio silence, including turning off its friend or foe transponder, it would still need to use radar to detect potential threats. The Canada saga related to purchasing F-35s was started under the Harper Conservatives and was crooked from day one. The Harper government first said that buying 65 F-35s would cost Canada $14.7 billion, but the Auditor General found that figure to be fudged, and an independent audit put the price tag at $44 billion over the lifetime of the planes. UBC international law professor Michael Byers and researcher Stuart Webb laid out the case against the Harper government's determination to spend tens of billions of dollars on a new generation of high-tech fighter, the US-built F-35. What would make better sense, they argue, is equipping, uh, in, in equipping Canada's Air Force uh, would be a super hornet. Now, as Tamara has laid out, we don't really need fighter jets in this country. But if we're going to buy a fighter jet, the Lockheed Martin F-35 has been labeled by um, critics as, as not being the one, to, one to, to do the job at all for Canada. Um, so there's other proven aircraft, they argue, the Super Hornets uh, already fly for the US and Australia and they cost 55 million each. Uh, the latest version of the CF-18 series, series and they also offer great reduced uh, training costs to Canada. The twin engine Super Hornets are more suited for the Arctic than the single engine F-35s. Canada chose the two engine uh, CF-18 in the 1980s because of concerns that a single engine would put pilots and planes at risk in remote locations. The F-35s are not only vastly behind schedule and over budget, Byers and Webb argue that they are a poor fit for the kind of missions the Canadian Air Force are likely to fly. Here are some snippets. At the current rate, Canada will not receive its full complement of F-35s until years after the CF-18s are retired. Just as worrisome is the fact that the first F-35s delivered to Canada will lack the technology necessary to communicate in the Arctic and to track troops on the ground, with the later function being essential to preventing casualties from friendly fire. Stealth technology would actually be a negative for Canada since it entails uh, compromises with respect to other capabilities. For stealth purposes, the F-35 fuselage is wider than fighter jets, which increases drag and reduces both speed and range. The fuselage is also uh, plated with radar absorbing materials, which add weight and further limit speed and range. Lockheed Martin admits that F-35s have a top speed of only Mach 1.6. Super Hornets and CF-18s in comparison, both top at uh, Mach 1.8. Stealth necessitates that missiles and bombs are stored internally, thereby limiting the munition cap capability of the F-35. It also necess necessitates internal fuel tanks unless non-stealth external fuel tanks are added. F-35s can fly only 2,200 kilometers without refueling and CF-18s have a range of 3,700 kilometers. Overall though, I think that Ta Tamara has laid out you know, really good arguments about why we even need uh, fighter jets in this country at all. We could be using the funds uh, that have been allocated for uh, fighter jets to, you know, fix the water problem on First Nations, deal with adequate housing on First Nations, deal with the poverty issues that we have in this country. We have a, a lot of serious uh, issues to deal with right here. And you know, if we want peace and security in the world, the way to start doing that is to ensure that we, we uh, increase development aid to other, other parts of the world. Um, that's where, you know, peace and uh, insecurity begins is, is uh, when people are fighting over water, fighting over food and fighting over land. And so we need to, I think, rejig our, our foreign policy and uh, move away from you know, definitely not be involved in uh, military adventurism with NATO and be looking at uh, a, a more diplomatic role uh, using our military for domestic purposes, for disaster relief, for our own security, 
and for UN missions. And uh, so I think it's, it's really time for a rethink of our foreign policy, and it's not a time right now to be uh, purchasing weapons. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, uh, Paul, for your pioneering efforts um, to break the silence in Parliament on, on this planned purchase. And also today for just enlightening us to the technical issues and real costs and real value of these offensive weapons. And also for giving us a window into the discussions that are taking place in the Green Party uh, around the review of these weapons and the need to reevaluate our military spending um, and international alliances. So thank you for your poignant description of the, the real meaning of security. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Senator Marilou McFedrin. Marilou McFedrin is a Canadian lawyer and human rights advocate. In October 2016, she was named to the Senate of Canada by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. She was the principal of the University of Winnipeg Global College in Manitoba, Canada between 2008 and 2012. She's a member of the Order of Canada and her affiliations uh, among many include the academic network of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Welcome, Mary Lou. Thank you very much, Bianca and Rachel and other co-hosts. Um, I am an independent Senator from Manitoba, which is Treaty One territory and is also known as the heart of the Métis Nation in Canada. I also spend quite a lot of time, as do my parliamentary colleagues, working out of Parliament um, in Canada in times that are not quite so unusual as, as the, during the pandemic. And of course, it's important to acknowledge that we, when we're there, when we're in Ottawa, we are on the unceded territory of the Algonquin peoples. I today really want to not repeat the very excellent and detailed analysis um, and evidence presented by both of uh, the previous speakers, Tamara and Paul. What I'd like to do, um, probably in fairly brief terms, is really invite all of us to think about the kind of shift that must take place and and it, what I'm saying is, is entirely consistent with the points that have already been made. But in looking at the way in which the pandemic is enabling militarism and enabling um, more oppressive forms of, of government and working against those who quest for greater fairness and equality, and that the whole idea of, quote, building back better, quote, is really an opportunity for us to really push this analysis, certainly in the kind of detail that we've heard already, but also to, to look at the various ways in which Canada is choosing militarism. The fighter jets are a powerful example of that. And I'd like to build on uh, points made by both um, Tamara and Paul about the way in which the cost of one fighter jet should actually be linked to costs of building a greater security that is human security in Canada as the single best investment we can make in a recovery. You know, we're, we were looking at a, predict, a prediction for 2024 of a GDP for Canada of approximately $2.7 trillion. And our membership in NATO has a price tag, which we've never fully paid, but which the United States has certainly been pressuring Canada um, very heavily to meet, and that is the 2% per member of, of NATO. If we were to have reached that projection for 2024, we would have been liable or responsible for almost $54 billion just to NATO. And the, as it stands at about 1.3% of our GDP, um, in fact, going to NATO, 
this is an opportunity for us to make powerful comparisons because choices have to be made. And so being able to communicate as parliamentarians and, and civil society advocates together to attach what it would mean to actually apply some of the principles of a feminist foreign policy and feminist analysis to be able to link not only the remediation of drinking water for our Indigenous peoples, but this morning I spent over an hour uh, on a call with one of our, our, our Grand Chief in Manitoba um, and a number of Senators talking about Indigenous children in Manitoba and the costs uh, of Jordan's principle, for example. I want to suggest that as a strategy of both analysis and communication that we need to do more of linking what it would cost to actually bring justice, climate justice, social justice, racial justice to our society and, weigh, and, and do that fighter jet by fighter jet. The other thing I want to suggest that we look at is the, the way, and again, this is back to the theme of the pandemic enabling militarism and how important it is for us to spot it and name it and respond to it in many different ways. And I'm going to use just one example. And that is the way in which Global Affairs Canada and um, uh, our arms trade, the industry um, is perpetuating the war in Yemen and the way in which the kind of, of arms deals, what Canada's the billions of dollars that, that Canada, some Canadians are, are reaping from the sale of arms to Saudi Arabia, which are showing up in Yemen. We have more than 100,000 Yemenis who are dead. We are, they are on the brink of famine. And for the very first time, as of June 2020, Canada was specifically named as one of the arms dealing countries that is causing this humanitarian crisis and fomenting what is uh, what the kind of resolution that is not within reach precisely because the emphasis is not in fact really on humanitarian aid. It's on selling billions of dollars um, in particular labs um, to Saudi Arabia. So for when we're looking at the jets, it's a very important symbol. It's very important that we're able to address security concerns that are raised for our country. And it's very important that we make that calculation of where each jet could actually contribute to a much stronger democracy, a much more peaceful and productive economy, and a recovery from the pandemic that doesn't leave, as we now have, massive fissures of inequality exposed throughout our entire country. And this is really a question of what we choose to invest in. And I do think it is time that we step back and seriously question what a NATO membership costs and what, in fact, the uh, harm that is done to people within Canada by continuing to invest in militarism, both in our country and also internationally. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Marilou. Thank you for sharing your experience and insights so generously and also for doing the math and contextualizing militarism as a choice, you know, within the context of this pandemic. And I hope that um, many will heed your warning that uh, it is in fact enabled by the, the pandemic. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is MP Randall Garrison, elected to the House of Commons in 2011 and re-elected in 2015 and 2019. He represents the electoral district of Esquimalt Sanit Shuk and is a member of the New Democratic Party. He serves as the NDP's defense critic justice critic and sexual orientation and gender identity spokesperson. Welcome, Randall. Uh, well, thank you very much, Bianca. And uh, I guess it's good evening for most people on the panel, although it's still late afternoon here. Uh, I'm speaking tonight from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples. 
Uh, and I want to start by saying thanks to all the peace activists among us tonight for your continuing commitment to striving for peace. I do see some very familiar faces around the screens as I, I scroll through. Um, and as you will hear from me tonight, we don't disagree on the goals, but I will say we may have some differences on how we get there and what we do in the interim. I don't expect to make myself particularly popular on this panel tonight, but I appreciate the invitation to be here and I'm glad to be able to listen to the previous presentations uh, where we heard very, very good critiques of the F-35 uh, purchase. And so I'm gonna skip some of the things I was intending to do and maybe spend a little more time speaking to you more personally uh, so that you understand where, where I'm coming from. I cut my organizing teeth as a teenager on opposing nuclear testing in the Pacific. Uh, we made the t-shirts, we organized the teach-ins, we organized the demonstrations. But what I learned there was the power of grassroots organizing, and I saw the success the grassroots had in bringing an end to nuclear testing. And it's an experience that has stayed with me all, all my life. So again, it's very, very important that uh, people at the grassroots committed to peace continue this important work. Over time, my own views uh, have become, I guess what I would say is more pragmatic, as I had the opportunity to work in conflict zones abroad. In 1983, I went to the front in Nicaragua to bear witness to the attacks by the US backed Contras and their attempt to overthrow the Sandinista government. Our civilian presence there at the very active front where the fighting was taking place, of course, didn't end the conflict, but it did produce a ceasefire that day, which allowed families and neighbors to reunite, to get together and go about their business in peace, at least for one day. And again, that personal witness and personal testimony has been a very important part of the peace movement. After that, I was privileged to work on peace building and human rights projects, mostly in Asia. I worked as an election observer in Muslim Mindanao in the Philippines. I worked in Indonesia on a peace building project between Christians and Muslims in Ambon with my partner. I later worked in East Timor as co-coordinator of the UN Human Rights Observer Mission for the UN-run independence referendum in 1999. After the yes vote of that referendum, the failure of the international community to get an international peacekeeping force to East Timor in a timely fashion allowed the murder of over 1,500 Timorese, many of them just outside the compound where we were holed up as observers. And it allowed the complete destruction of the infrastructure of East Timor, every school, every sewage system, every water system, the entire infrastructure was destroyed by militias armed by Indonesia. And East Timor is still struggling to recover from that tragedy. Later, I worked for Amnesty International as a human rights researcher in Afghanistan. This was early on when Canadian troops were first present there. There were, of course, many faults in that intervention. But being there gave me a close-up uh, view of the impacts of Taliban violence directed against women and against my own sexual orientation and gender identity community. As part of that work, I met a woman who preferred to stay in prison where she had been sent by her family for refusing an arranged marriage. She wanted to stay there out of fear that her family would kill her upon her release as she planned to continue to refuse the marriage. As part of that work, I met gay men desperate to escape a country where the preferred penalty for gay sex is still to be buried alive and have a wall pushed on you. The international presence in Afghanistan at that time allowed NGOs to work and to aid the most vulnerable in that society. These experiences changed my views on how we get from where we are to a world without war, and in particular, how we get there without sacrificing the most vulnerable among us. There is an absolute need for Canada to play a larger role in international peacekeeping and protection of the vulnerable, but also in peacemaking. In 2019, I visited the Canadian mission in Mali, uh, as well as visiting Canadian troops in Latvia and Canadian trainers working in the Ukraine. All of those missions very welcomed by the local population. We can't forget that Russia seized and holds by force over 20% of, of Ukraine. Canada is there working both on democratic reform and reform of the military in Ukraine, so Ukraine can withstand the Russian pressure. And Russia would gladly destroy the independence of Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, as it has done in Belarus. Putin is dissuaded only by the NATO forward deployment by Canada, led by Canada in Latvia. Of course, there are other important things the Canadian military also needs to do. 
One of those is to protect sovereignty in the Arctic, which is being directly challenged by China, Russia, and the United States, all interested in petroleum exploration and undersea mining, both of which would be disastrous for the Arctic ecology and the future of the Earth. And of course, there is always an important role for the Canadian military in emergency response, uh, even as we saw that playing out in unexpected ways during the COVID crisis. So the, the NDP defense policy is this, that we need to provide Canadian forces uh, and their members with the training, equipment and support they need to do the difficult and dangerous work we ask them to do on our behalf each and every day. We can't cut military spending until we are able to cut back on those tasks but we're also calling for every dollar increase in military spending for an equal expenditure on conflict prevention and international development. As a side note on Canada's actual military expenditures, over the last two decades, the operational budget of the Canadian military has remained steady in real terms. There has not been a gigantic increase. We still spend slightly more, uh, about 1.3% of the GDP, uh, than we did in the most recent years, but no more per capita in real dollars than we did two decades ago. So Canada is not dealing with the wild and obscene uh, levels of military expending as the US, but there's no need to give in to US pressure to support their demand to increase their military spending to 2% of our GDP. Now other speakers have well pointed to better things we could do with this money, but I would argue that the same point applies to fossil fuel subsidies, and the same point applies to making the rich and pandemic profiteers pay their fair share of the costs as we go forward. So I, can, I believe that we can do all the things I've talked about in terms of international peacekeeping, in terms of defending Arctic sovereignty, uh, and in terms of uh, protecting the vulnerable internationally while still working for peace. There are many actions Canada could take, and I would argue historically, we would have taken those actions. For instance, it's unbelievable to me that Canada has not signed on to the Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty. Not only should we sign on, we should be a key proponent of that treaty around the world. And as long as we're a member of NATO, I've been calling for us to take the disarmament chair of the NATO committees, which is currently vacant, and press very hard for uh, NATO to come up with good plans, first of all, to divest of nuclear weapons, and secondly, to begin to disarm. We played an essential role internationally in banning landmines. We picked up on the initiative that came from the grassroots international campaign to ban landmines, and we hosted the international meetings that resulted in the Ottawa Treaty. This is a good example of the kind of things we should be doing on areas like the Nuclear Ban Treaty. There is so much more we can do, but we seem to have given up that leadership role. Now, what about those fighter jets? You have no doubt some idea of where my remarks are leading. What do I challenge about this fighter jet purchase? Well, I do challenge the purchase of stealth first strike fighters like the F-35. We have no need for these. And no, I don't think it's necessary to spend $19 billion on fighter jets, but I do and so does the NDP, support the purchase of new jets. Yes, we still need fighter jets, but ones that can land in the Arctic in contrast to the F-35, and ones which will be built in Canada so we can preserve an independent aeronautics industry. And also ones that can insist in international peacekeeping roles by defending airspace against outside forces. So where are we today? Obviously, we're in an increasingly unstable world headed to climate catastrophe. We are in a world where Putin seizes territory from sovereign neighboring nations by force, where Chinese President Xi Ping just told Chinese troops, quote, to focus their minds on preparing for war. But we also live in a world where there is some hope, one where I believe Trump will soon be out of power. So New Democrats are calling for staying the course on defense while at the same time working for peace. I do not believe this is a contradiction. I believe it is a necessity. I thank all of you for listening to what I had to say tonight. No, I'm not part of some evil conspiracy. I'm just a Canadian who believes we all have to push our government to take collective action to build peace and prevent climate catastrophe. Peace activists always have been and will continue to be a key part of the future that we must get to very soon. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Randall, for sharing your very personal history and reminding us all uh, of the power of social movements and, um, and your admiration for peace activists. It's key, it is key for us to have elected representatives who are willing to engage with the growing call for a halt to these purchases. And thank you for clarifying the NDP position, the need to resist uh, pressure from the US to increase military spending. And, uh, and I look forward to hearing more, more from you in the Q&A. So our final speaker of the evening is Elle Jones. Um, she is a poet, professor, and activist living in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She was Halifax's Poet Laureate from 2013 to 2015 and author of the book, Live from the African Resistance. Welcome, Elle. Thank you, good evening. I'm gonna do a couple of poems, but before I do those, I just want to state clearly my position that just like with policing, where we are supposed to believe that we can somehow have safety and security from police busting into our homes with tasers and guns and killing us and that this is a wellness check, I similarly do not believe that sending troops into other countries brings peace in any way, nor that we need to defend our air or our Arctic or anything else uh, from anybody else through violence, and we will never bring peace from violence. And these kind of ideologies need to be challenged because just like we have with policing, where we have an ingrained ideology of punishment that teaches us that the solution to social problems is to punish and police people, we similarly have some kind of idea that this idea of a nation, which doesn't exist, and we do not need to be defending in any way, we should actually be returning it to indigenous people and focusing on indigenous sovereignty and indigenous ways of living within our territories. Uh, similarly, I do not believe that the notion that we will somehow protect ourselves or bring any safety or security through violence, which as we know is constantly rained upon brown people and black people around this globe and is part of colonization. So let's also connect the colonial powers of the police and the military together. Let's understand how when we talk about police violence, they are also arming themselves increasingly with militarized weapons. And so that we cannot have Black Lives Matter discussions, for example, about policing without also recognizing the military, its role in uh, destroying the sovereignty of Africa and its role in ongoing colonization around the world. And just as we reject policing, we need to reject the ideologies of militarism as well. So with that said, um, I'm going to do a couple of poems. This one has a refrain that you could do if you were speaking back to me. You'll hear it. It's not one more drop. So here we go. They say there's one rule for the few and another for the many. Trillions of dollars for the banks and the poor get not a penny. And they've convinced us all that the crumbs they give are plenty and that's why people in Alberta elected Jason Kenney. Well that and that they always have some brown folk as the enemy. When indigenous people block the pipelines, they send the military and there's lead all in the water, but is water necessary? And you can't even afford the plot in your family cemetery. But just blame the immigrants in the media commentary. They've got the white folks marching to save the job of millionaire Don Cherry. And whether we wear poppies got the white folk in a frenzy. And in the Toronto mayoral election, the third place was a Nazi. They voted in Doug Ford because his brother seems so friendly. And they'll sell you dollar beers while your pension fund stays empty. Don't have any savings while your banker drives a Bentley. And they hold up billionaires as the people we should envy. Children in this country can't put breakfast in their belly. People on assistance can't even pay to ride the ferry. They make billions off the weapons that are used against Yemenis, but if you possess a gun, well, then the courts will give you 20. But when corporations violate, the government won't condemn them because there's one law for the people, but for the rich, the laws are bendy. And you end your life in debt and the burden is too heavy, so your kids go off to foreign countries where they end up buried. So to the killers at the top, not one more drop. Generals, guards, and cops, not one more drop. And they plunder, steal, and rob. And they strip us of our jobs, but we will not join their mobs. Not one more drop. Not one more drop of poor and working class blood for their capitalistic wars. So they send the working class to die in wars they can't find in the atlas. Military surplus goes to cops who use black men as target practice. They keep the oil wells running guarded by private military contractors while the sanctions they imposed killed millions of Iraqis. In their black site prisons, locals tortured by their captors. And then they say that terrorism was caused by other factors. Military budget keeps exploding like a nuclear reactor while the livelihood of ordinary people broken into fractures. They'll offer luxury condos to the Toronto Raptors while the homeless on the street can't even find a benefactor. When WikiLeaks showed their war crimes, they imprisoned all the hackers and they fire all the athletes who tell us Black Lives Matter. 
but the war machine keeps rolling like weed into a tractor. Hollywood propaganda, we've got snipers played by actors and they tell us hope and change came with President Obama so the people vote again for their neoliberal masters. Don't even watch the news, it's all corporate paid chatter, all designed for you to serve your children on a platter. Slavery is a choice, says another foolish rapper, and now Amazon's invested so your doorbell is a tracker. While the workers are on food stamps and death row is getting blacker, preaching prosperity gospel so you're brainwashed by your past Corporations making money after every disaster. They sent UN troops to Haiti and spread cholera in the water. And so there's endless war and endless blood that splatters. Syria, Afghanistan, Somalia is all another chapter. And there's always some brown person that they'll say is the attacker and every politician paid by corporate backers. So to the killers at the top, not one more drop. Generals, guards, and cops, not one more drop. And they plunder, steal, and rob. So they strip us of our jobs, but we will not join their mobs, not one more drop, not one more drop of poor and working class blood for their capitalistic wars. So now there's open slave markets because the US destroyed Libya. We took in a few thousand refugees and say we're saving Syria. Stoke the terrorism from Turkey to Nigeria and now a military coup that's taken down Bolivia. They say they're white and Christian so they cut indigenous insignia. Bolsonaro in Brazil kills black folk like it's just trivial. Canadian mining companies in the Amazon with private militia, rainforest burning, but we raise money for the Notre Dame Basilica because white supremacy is spreading across the globe like a bacteria. There's wars across the border between Pakistan and India. British colonial legacies left conflict in every arena, but they say that we're just savage and they talk of us as primitive. So Trump builds a border wall, just like the walls in Israel. Obama used his drone strikes to send teenagers to oblivion. There's bases across the world from Japan to the Caribbean and the powerful manipulate the people to be their useful idiots. Race and religion are their tools to sow division. Populist politicians while rich folk rake in another billion and the rich buy all the votes while the ballot box is filling because the military industrial complex always makes a killing. So to the killers at the top, not one more drop. Generals, guards, and cops, not one more drop. They can plunder, steal, and rob. They can strip us of our jobs, but we will not join their mob. Not one more drop, not one more drop of poor and working class blood for their capitalistic wars. Not one more drop of black and working class blood for their imperialistic wars. Thank you. I'm going to do one more poem and then we'll go to the Q&A. This poem is from uh, every year there's a what they call a, a, a the what is it the Halifax Security Forum that is now in its uh, 10th or 11th year now started by uh, Peter McKay under Harper supposed to pay for itself but of course paid for it by the taxpayers where literally the politicians go into the West End and plot war. They used to have their agenda up online and you could go back and see previous years where they'd literally be like Syria? the path into Iran, you know, and like literally be planning their future wars. So this is uh, where all the generals, NATO, they've had the defense ministers from Israel, Condi Rice came through one year, uh, McCain's been through. So every year we protest this rally. So this is uh, maybe from 2015 or 16, this is the protest poem. You can sing along in this one too. These have refrains. We built this city we built this city on land we stole. Built this city. We built this city on land we stole. We built this city on Cornwallis and Britain. We built this city on colonialism. Built on Mi'kmaq land without permission. We built this city with ammunition. And now that it's risen, we build it on prisons. We're building off mental disease and addictions. No industry left, so we build on tourism. We're building a city of militarism. An off-record panels inside of the West and by Western officials with global ambitions, build with taxpayer dollars, but deny us admission. Defense minister building with McKay's traditions. We're building on rhetoric of change and transition while behind closed doors, it's the same old position. We build interventions and armed expeditions. We claim bombing campaigns or human rights propositions. We build up Trudeau, build with liberalism, same military, same wars, just new government edition. We build while indigenous women go missing. They build over bagpipes and lobster dinners, and then they go home and build nuclear winters. 
We built the city on capitalism. We built TPP and free trade propositions. We built Walmarts to push out local competition, build cheap Chinese goods in sweatshop conditions. We build the economy, global acquisitions, send jobs offshore unemployment decisions, use up all the coal, cut the trees over fishing, build up the North End Africa bill demolition. We're building off poverty, armed forces enlistment, can't get a job so you get a commission. Build up the shipyards to Irving's conditions, ships start here so we're building off wishing. Still building off Harper, although we dismissed him, we're gentrifying the projects off that 300 billion. We're building the city on military missions, building weapons and warships to use on brown children. We build off the blood of Afghans and Libyans, we're building with drone strikes on Yemen and Syrians. Collateral damage, we take out civilians, we build global war over pipeline positions. We're building the city on carbon emissions. We're building a cycle of radicalism. We tortured Arar, extraordinary rendition. We built occupations, just changed definitions. We helped to build ISIS, historical revision. We built Boko Haram to get oil from Nigerians. We build instability, build opposition. We destabilize the Mideast societal demolition. We build arms trades with the Saudis, geopolitical divisions. We fight proxy wars by our allies' decisions. We're one of the willing. We build coalitions with the US and NATO and Israel politicians. We helped to build settlements, walls, and partitions, build an open air prison in Gaza for Palestinians. We're building an African new colonial mission, build a security state from the war on terrorism, cyber surveillance built by government technicians. We built a spy wet network, the new inquisition. We're building a world where we all are suspicious. We're building two classes of Canadian citizens. We build Islamophobia and hate crimes commission. We build off a racist immigration point system. We build off the tattoo military tradition. Lockheed Martin on campus helps bill our tuition. We say we're building new weapons to strike with precision, building new drones with facial recognition. We're building an economy on death and attrition. We're building new treaties on nuclear fission. We build NGOs, then we send in tacticians. We use foreign aid to build imperialism. We build occupations and call it assistance. We build cholera, refugee camps, malnutrition. We build piles of dead bodies in decomposition. We built a new world from 9-11 fruition. We're building this world off of war repetition. The theater of war is an endless audition. We built Al-Qaeda, we're building militias. We build retaliation, a cycle so vicious, New York, Beirut, Paris, Marie, Mali, and Garissa. Military strikes just further ignition. We build global war and there's no intermission. We're building ourselves out of human existence. And we're not bystanders. We're not an omission because don't you hear that radio transmission? Don't you remember? Take it back to the beginning. We built this city. We built this city on land we stole. Built this city. We built this city on land we stole. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the Q&A. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Al. Thank you for your clear condemnation of the ideology of militarism and for sharing your, your beautiful poems and a fairly comprehensive history of Canada's lesser known harmful role around the world. Uh, that was a primer on pretty much everything we need to change about Canadian foreign policy and uh, a challenge to get active. And we know that art is transformational, so what a powerful way to end this portion of our discussion. I just wanna thank all of our speakers again, Tamara, Paul, Marilou, Randall, and Al. I'm now going to hand over to Rachel Small, who's going to be moderating the question and answer period uh, of our event. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, I, I just have to echo what Bianca said in thanking all of uh, our speakers. And um, I, I was very moved by, by that poem. So thank you uh, again, Al, <laughs> additionally. Um, so there have been many questions that have been submitted in the chat, and we're going to begin with some of the ones that have already been shared. Um, I would encourage anyone else with questions. I see some people's uh, hands are up, but we're, we're far too many people here to, to use the hand system. So please type your questions in the chat. Um, and I want to thank my uh, colleague uh, Greta for monitoring the chat and compiling those questions. So I'm going to start with uh, a round of questions uh, that were each directed to a particular speaker. So I'm going to read out the questions for each speaker and then I'll hand it to the first one to answer the first question. So um, first we have a, a question that's directed to Paul and Randall. The question is, as has been raised this evening, while the sticker price for the fighter jets may be 19 billion, the life cycle cost of the planes over the next 20 years could be closer to 45 billion or even as high as 60 billion. Would you be willing to both publicly call and ask in the House of Commons for an Auditor General's report 
to determine the actual cost of the fighter jets. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll read out the next question that's directed for Marilou, and then I'll, I'll pass it back to Paul and then Randall to answer that first question. For Marilou, the question is, what role could the Senate play in stopping the purchase of these fighter jets? Um, could anything be done to slow down the process? For example, Senate committee hearings. Do you have any ideas on uh, this front or are there things activists could call in the Senate to do? And then the question that's waiting in the line for Tamara <laughs> is, uh, for, it, it says for Tamara, as someone uh, like you who has studied this issue for many years since you've written about the near silence from the government on this huge purchase, please tell us what your response is to what the two MPs and the Senator have raised tonight in breaking that silence. So I'm first gonna turn it to Paul and then Randall and then to Mary Lou and Tamara. And if need be, I'd be happy to repeat the question. So over to you, Paul. So I would absolutely be willing to call for the Auditor General to be looking at uh, the actual costs of these fighter jets. But I would, I would take that farther. I would just call like, you know, for the elimination of the of the purchase, like eliminating the F-35 completely. And uh, for ha having an, an analysis of the need for the fighter jets. So we don't have a proper uh, process for procurement uh, for the military in Canada. There was just a, um, a webinar about this and we don't have a, a, a good process that actually looks at these needs and we're being heavily influenced by the military industrial complex in and by NATO to be involved in this purchase. So um, I think it needs to be questioned uh, overall and um, uh, I definitely would would ask for the Auditor General to have a really close look and when the Auditor General did look after it was proposed by um, uh, Stephen Harper, you know, with the life, the full lifespan of an F-35 was closer to half a billion uh, dollars per plane, which is well above the sticker price we're being told about. Thank you, Paul. Now I'll pass the mic to you, Randall. Um, uh, thanks very much and, and thanks for the question. Uh, the Defence Committee right now, we're trying to get the reports that have already been done by the Auditor General and uh, another report done by the Parliamentary Budget Office, who's an independent officer of Parliament. So these reports, in fact, already exist. And what we're trying to do is get them before the public in the Defence Committee. And I'm hopeful that we can do that this fall, uh, because uh, I do share the concerns about the, especially the cost of the F-35 escalating far out of control. But uh, the reports really are already done and we'll just try to get some publicity to them uh, as soon as we can. Are those updated reports? Because there was one in 2013, Randall. Are those, have there been further No, th reports? these are both recent. They're both recent reports that the government's sitting on. Okay. Okay, so um, that, that's, that's news to me as well. And, um, and, and that's very interesting on that. I, I imagine there might be follow-up questions on that. <laughs> but to move on to uh, Mary Lou right now with the question about the role of the Senate, I'll pass the mic to her. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, and thank you, you to, uh, to whoever asked the question. Similarly, um, in the Senate, there is a committee process that would allow Exam closer examination of this. I'm interested particularly in the reference to the parliamentary budget officer because in the past, certainly on a number of issues as an individual senator, I've requested very thorough costing and accounting and the reporting relationship is to me as the parliamentarian who made the request. So one other way or additional way of trying to get the information, um, this is something that those of us parliamentarians who are part of the panel today, we may want to together um, make a request of the parliamentary budget office and, and uh, on our own, which would then make the reporting relationship directed to us. Um, so that is one practical step that we may want to consider. I'd be more than happy to take some initiative on that and would welcome hearing from my, my parliamentary colleagues. Um, and then as, as Randall has outlined, um, also in the Senate, we have a standing committee on security and defense. And um, 
we have it in, in uh, I guess, in theory at this point, um, because the committees for the most part in the Senate, as a result of COVID, and as a result of the culture of the Senate, shall we say, um, have ac actually aren't operating. Um, and so there isn't a security and defense committee to which I could bring the kind of inquiries that Randall has outlined. Um, we don't even know at this point who the members are going to be. And I'm not defending that in any way. Please understand, I'm not being an apologist for it. I'm just stating a fact for you to understand the, the current situation. But in addition to that, um, the point made, um, I, I think it was Randall, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, um, about Canada's absence from the nuclear ban treaty. Um, absence. I mean, Canada wasn't even in the room at the UN um, in the last round that led to the treaty reaching the point where it actually was, was um, in its final stage. And our absence is, is not an oversight. Um, we, we really, um, I think as a, a number of us as senators speak to this issue, I, I certainly have raised it a number of times, and it is the opportunity that many of us, uh, and I, I will just speak for myself at least, in welcoming civil society leadership, um, and when it's not possible to present to committees, to be able to facilitate um, similar Zoom webinars like what we're doing here, uh, because a lot of what I think has happened is that the the NATO view of, of the way it must be is largely accepted without question. And it, it, it really does merit a lot of questions, including a question about how it is that Canada no longer has an ambassador for disarmament. Um, it's a wonderful ambassadorship that was established on women, peace and security. And in no way does that take away from the importance of our going back to having an ambassador on disarmament. Um, the, the chair that is, has been mentioned at NATO that's sitting vacant, in all likelihood, these kinds of vacancies are, are highly reflective of the vacancies in policy and in the a worldview that is almost entirely developed through a militaristic lens. And so senators for the most part, uh, and I, I do also want to acknowledge concerns that are raised about many aspects of the Senate. However, the simple fact is at this stage in our history as a country is that it's a constitutionally entrenched second house of a bicameral parliamentary system. Um, and that, that latest decision of the Supreme Court of Canada is 2012. So to the question of what more senators can do, we really are, uh, have the kind of security that my former life in a university as a tenured full professor, I mean, we are exactly the people who need to be raising the difficult questions. We are exactly the people who need to be using our resources to study issues more deeply. Um, we are exactly the people who need to speak for minority voices and perspectives in our country. And, uh, and so I'll, I'll issue an invitation. I mean, I, I am a former board member of Voice of Women for Peace, but if there are ways in which I as an individual Senator can amplify the voices um, of peace activists on issues as important as, as this issue. And it's not only about the jets, it's about overall military spending and priorities that get pushed out. Um, and the last thing I'll say in answer to the question is that, you know, it was Eisenhower who said, every ship, every plane, every, every time money is spent on that, People who are hungry are not fed and people who are cold do not have clothing. And it really is, it really does come down to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm gonna now pass the mic to um, Tamara for uh, the question regarding uh, 
as someone who has written extensively about the near silence from the government on this huge purchase, if she has any response to what, uh, what has been raised tonight. I'll pass it to you, Tamara. Well, I just want to remind everybody that in the House of Commons and in the Senate, there are defense committees. There are no committees for peace and disarmament. So this highly militarized uh, security narrative gets repeated and echoed between the chambers. Um, also, defense procurement right now is not considering the climate impacts. So I am appealing to the Senate and to the House of Commons to do studies, not just on the life cycle costs of the fighter jets, but also to do gender-based analysis studies of the fighter jets. This is a commitment that the Liberals made when they came into uh, power. They said that all major decisions and purchases uh, would go through a gender-based analysis. So that should be done and that should be made public. There also needs to be a public environmental assessment of the fighter jets and Canadians need to know what the climate impacts of the fighter jets will, will, will be and what the plan is by the government to offset those emissions because the number one priority is to deal with the climate breakdown and the ecological breakdown. There are, there are no greater threats than dealing with the climate crisis. And then I just want to address quickly something that Randall said about military spending. Uh, actually, military spending has doubled in the past 15 years in Canada. Um, if you look at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute's report or in the NATO Defense Extend Expenditures report, you'll see that Canada is ranked 14th highest in the world for military spending. According to NATO's Defense Expenditures report, we're sixth highest among all NATO members and we spend over $30 billion on the military. This is 30 times more than we spend on the Department of Environment and Climate Change. So our priorities are all, are all wrong. And if the NDP um, uh, wants to claim that it cares about climate justice, uh, it is going to have to look much more carefully at the climate impacts of these fighter jets and the justice, social justice issue uh, as well. And then, and, and should, and should uh, bring that to uh, party members' uh, attention and to the public. Thanks. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you to everyone for submitting such uh, thoughtful and well thought out uh, questions. We won't get through all of them, but we do have time for a few more. Um, so there is a question directed towards Paul, Randall, and Marilou, um, which is, would you support the call for a gender-based analysis plus, GBA plus, of the impacts of women, uh, impacts on women of the fighter jet purchase and how would that be initiated in the House or the Senate? Um, and there's also another question that's directed to everyone. So I'll, I'll, I'll mention the second one at first, and then I'll turn to all three of you to answer it. The second question to everyone is that the defense minister has recently assured Canadians that Canada will not be cutting back on the defense budget in general, despite the pandemic. Um, what is your stance on this position? So I will this time start with Mary Lou and then Randall and then Paul for both of those questions. Over to you, Mary Lou. Thank you. Um, without a doubt, I, I support the gender-based analysis. Um, and, as, and I would add to that um, Tamara's point about the climate impacts of, of the jets. I think we um, uh, currently in the Senate, there is a bill that um, acknowledges that gender-based analysis, although promised by the government and carried out, we're told, on major decisions and major legislation, it um, is protected information that is generally not shared when it's leading up to a budget. So the, the, bud the analysis apparently is being done, but we don't know the quality, the extent, um, because it is protected by, by cabinet privilege. And this bill that has been introduced by Senator Mary Jane McCollum, a colleague of mine from an independent senator from Manitoba, um, 
addresses this and go and also addresses the need for gender based analysis plus to be more clearly defined um, and to have uh, as part of that clear definition, much more emphasis on um, racial and uh, social justice. There was a second part to the question and I'm going to have to ask you, Rachel, to remind me, please. Of course, so the second part, uh, well, there was a part that was how would a gender-based analysis be initiated in the House or the Senate? So what would be the specific process for that? And then the second larger question, related to defense minister recently assuring Canadians that Canada will not be cutting back on its defense budget despite the pandemic and, and what would be your position on that? Well, I, I, I personally have the sense that we are going to go into a period of cutting uh, budget um, and uh, defense budgets. Um, I think that we are facing now a trillion debt related to the pandemic. And I'll just go back to my point about 2024, the projection of our GDP with no pandemic was at 2.7 trillion. So we're already more than a third over that projection, a uh, por portion of that projection. So how we can proceed to prioritize military spending when we are facing the kinds of devastating costs that um, Canadians and generations and generations of Canadians are going to have to bear. Um, and I'm just gonna put in parentheses that I also have a bill, 209, to lower the federal voting age in Canada to 16. And one of the reasons that I, I have that bill um, is because, precisely because we have piled on the young shoulders of Canadians, um, the results of this almost trillion debt. And uh, the importance, I think, extends to defense spending, to the whole concept of climate justice, which if we're going to get to that, we've got to look at defense spending. Um, and so for, as, a, as a senator, I think that we can't, uh, we don't make financial decisions. Um, we have a questioning role. Um, we have a, an analytical role to try to expand on the knowledge that um, is brought to any bill or, or, or legislation that, that comes to our side of, the, of Parliament. Um, initiating expenditures is something and approving expenditures is something that elected members of parliament have the primary responsibility for. Um, so I'm going to pass those those two questions um, again on to Randall and then Paul. I'm going to ask us to be as brief, brief as possible with our answers because I would love to do another round of questions time permitting. There are so many interesting questions being submitted. Over to you Randall. Um, okay, so I want to start by thanking Tamara for highlighting the climate impacts and I'll make a commitment to her now that I will do some more work to try and, and see if that work has been done and if not to ask that it, that it is done. So I'll make that commitment to you uh, right now, Tamara. Uh, and in terms of gender-based analysis, my suspicion uh, is that Senator McFedrin is right, that this work is being done. And again, there are several reports on fighter jet replacement that the, that the current government is sitting on and keeping from the public. And so I'm recommitting myself to something I've already been working on here, is to get all that information made public as, as soon as we can. Uh, in terms of the defense budget, uh, the COVID uh, crisis has caused the military a stress on the military budget, just like every other budget. And I think everyone here is aware that the, the military stepped in to provide assistance in long-term care homes. Uh, there was no increase in the military budget for doing that. There are many other expenses that the military, like every other aspect of society, has had to absorb to keep uh, members uh, safe. So no, I do not support a cut to the current military budget. Uh, thank you, and, and over to you, Paul. Um, yeah, I think, you know, a gender-based analysis on, on fighter jet purchases would be uh, an appropriate thing to do, but I think we need to go well beyond that and look at, at the military uh, um, structure and, and how we're tied into the military industrial complex. And Senator McFedrin was highlighting this earlier, earlier on about arms sales that we're doing to Saudi Arabia. We're selling, we're selling arms to, to, uh, to Turkey, to arms 
uh, Saudi Arabia, weapons all over the world. And we need to do an analysis of, of how that affects uh, destabilizing uh, other parts of the world. We're feeding uh, war around the world and we're using that as you know, profiteering for corporations. And yeah, there's good union jobs uh, to make weapons, but we need to have an analysis of what our place is in the world. And we are not a, a peaceful nation when it comes right down to it. Tamara is right about talking about the military expenditures and where we fit within NATO and in about our the, the arms sales that we have in this country. And we need to look at how we fit in, uh, you know, balance that out with, with how we're helping other other people around the, the world in peace and security and development. And you know, what is what is more important? What is a human life worth? What, you know, what are our goals in terms of climate change and and military uh, spending? And you know, we're not doing a proper analysis of, of uh, how much our, our military uh, contributes to climate change. And they don't do that in the United States either. So we need to get on with a lot of things and, and really question uh, all of this and, and look at it through a number of different lenses. Um, and yes, we should, cut the, we should cut the defense budget. We should make sure that we have defense uh, spending in line with a disaster uh, assistance uh, with a Coast Guard to make sure that we can take care of Can Canadians and that, that our, our military are equipped with the things that they need to actually take care of Canadians. Thank you. Um, so there's, uh, there's been a number of questions raised that have to do with transparency and process and I see one that's been shared that sort of sums up a lot of, of what's being asked in a concrete way. So I'm going to um, use that as our as our last question before we run out of time. Um, so the question is geared specifically again to Paul and Randall and it concerns, do you know um, for what the specific dates are or timeline is when the decision on the fighter jets will be made and when the contract would be signed? And if you don't know, could you ask this in the house? Um, and as well, in a related note, will there be space for a House debate or committee hearings between um, the choice of the fighter jet, the step of the U.S. approving that choice, as the media reports, and the actual signing of the contract? Um, so questions about the planned process and timeline, um, how that information could be obtained. Um, Etc. So I will uh, go back to Randall and then and then over to Paul on that. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, the government has said they're going to make a decision in 2022 uh, uh, on the fighter jets. So we still have some time. And what I'm working on now as a member of the Defense Committee is trying to get public hearings that look at the costs and look at all the issues surrounding this uh, replacement contract. So uh, do I think we can do that? Yes, I actually do. It's a minority parliament. So uh, I think the Defense Committee has a good prospect of getting some a public study going on this before the decision is actually made. Um, I'm going to pass the mic to, to Paul, and then I see that the question was also uh, geared towards Tamara's insight on this question, so I'm going to pass it to her afterwards to finish up. Over to you, Paul. I don't have a lot to add on that, on that in terms of the timelines, but I think, you know, a good healthy debate in Canada about this would, would be appropriate. Uh, we need a, a public discussion on this, and so having hearings and, and uh, having a, a good close look at this uh, purchase and how it fits our priorities as a country would be very important. So it sounds like there's a, a lack of clarity on, on if there will be a house debate or committee hearings on, on, on the timeline, but I'm hearing uh, a commitment to find uh, more out about that and, and share that. Please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong there. I'll do um, some digging. Um, and then over to Tamara to answer the same question, and and then uh, and then we'll wrap up. I'd like to say that Canada's uh, former top diplomat, uh, Daryl Copeland, who served all around the world, he wrote the book Guerrilla Diplomacy, said in an interview that there are no military solutions for the most profound problems imperiling the planet. It's got to be diplomacy. The truth is 
we all need to have the courage to say demilitarization, to call for a reduction in the military budget, which is not providing the kind of security that we need for the 21st century challenges that we're facing, to cut the military budget and to move that into our most pressing social and environmental needs. Um, I also want to leave people with the example of Costa Rica. Randall in his remarks mentioned uh, Nicaragua and uh, a neighbor to Nicaragua is uh, Costa Rica that abolished its military uh, 70 years ago and uh, it has said that its process of demilitarizing has helped, it, has helped it in the process of decarbonizing. It's Costa Rica that has announced it will be the first country to decarbonize. It was Costa Rica that has led the disarmament um, talks on a new nuclear ban treaty that Canada is refusing to join. So um, we need to look at those kinds of examples around uh, diplomacy and demilitarization to help us uh, with a new security uh, vision for this country. Thanks. I hate to, to bring an end to a, a conversation and a, a truly engaging and thoughtful Q&A uh, like this, but unfortunately, we, we've truly reached the end of our, of our time. Um, I do once again want to thank all of the speakers and everyone here, the hundreds of you who joined here, as well as those watching on the live stream for, for joining in this important and timely discussion today. Um, I would encourage all of you to consider engaging with your own MP if they weren't part of this conversation tonight um, and other political representatives on this issue. Um, I will share uh, one easy way of doing so that World Beyond War has set up, which is an online letter writing tool. I'll share the link in the chat, but it takes uh, just one minute through that tool to send a message to your MP and all the party leaders. And you can certainly edit the message in there to reflect uh, your views and position on the fighter jet issue. The email is completely editable. Um, World Beyond War for our part will, of course, continue after tonight to advocate uh, against the purchase of fighter jets as well as the uh, trade, purchase, and investment in really all weapons and military tools, especially those um, designed to, to bomb. <laughs> um, and we would invite anyone interested to join with us on this campaign and on our broader goals and mission. Um, finally, I will turn it back over to Bianca to wrap up. Over to you, Bianca. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you. Um, thank you all so much um, for a really lively discussion. It's been quite an extraordinary evening. I know I've learned a lot. And um, I just want to thank you, Rachel, for your, for your skillful moderation. I want to thank the panelists again, Tamara, Paul, Mary Lou, Randall, and Elle for um, just so generously sharing your insights and your knowledge, um, and to the audience for your brilliant questions. Um, so I just want to thank the endorsing organizations, um, as well as World Beyond War and Canadian Dimension again for the incredible work they've done to make this event a reality and to our co-sponsor Peace Quest. So please check out all of these amazing groups. Um, Peace Quest have been tweeting, find out more about this campaign to stop the fighter jet purchase. Um, check out World Beyond War's website. We know we only have a narrow window of opportunity um, to stop this purchase of these next generation war machines. So let's, let's stay active on, on this issue. Um, and you can find out more about the Foreign Policy Institute and our campaign for a reassessment, a fundamental reassessment of Canadian foreign policy at foreignpolicy.ca. So I'm wishing you all a good evening and that's it for our program today. Thank you.